Thanks very much. And thanks, thank, thanks for the invitation to uh, contribute to this panel. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and hearing what everyone else has to say. Uh, I was charged with giving what we call the 30,000 foot view of the, uh, uh, of the basin from a climate standpoint. And as you know, 30,000 feet is where jets fly. So I'm gonna be flying through this 10 minute presentation pretty quickly, um, but just wanna give you a taste of where things sit climatologically in the basin. I will mention just quickly, I'm getting some feedback. So I don't know if that means someone has I, I was looking at that, David. I, I muted Jerry, but that did not help. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that as well. Well, oh, that sounds better. That sounds okay. better. All right, great. I just don't want everybody else to be uh, annoyed. Um, hearing me once, not twice, is just much better. Um, but anyway, greetings from the State Climate Office in New Jersey. All the states in the Delaware Basin have state climatologists. Um, we are here as applied climatologists to help people make decisions. We won't make the decisions for you, but we will bring our data and expertise to the table to help you identify problems and, and work towards solving them. So that's what state climate offices tend to do. I'm at Rutgers. Um, many state climatologists are at land grant universities. Um, where we've been sitting for, in my case, 30 years as the New Jersey state climatologist. Talk about the big 30,000 foot view. This is like the 30,000 mile view uh, of the climate system. I only put it here just to introduce you the fact it is a system full of these spheres and powered by solar energy that makes its way into the atmosphere and strikes the surface of the earth, be it the hydrosphere, the, the biosphere, and, and my favorite being a polar scientist is, uh, is the cryosphere. And let us not forget the lithosphere uh, either with its volcanic activity and continentality and such. So it's this wonderfully complex system that is drives uh, the dynamics for our, that generates our climate in the atmosphere, the relationships with the oceans, the relationship with land and cryosphere and, oh yeah, front and center there, human activities. Humans playing a significant role in our climate system in recent decades. It's been identified, it's been going on for really multiple centuries in one way, shape or form. Um, but humans are front and center when it comes to discussing climate today. Um, our region, the Delaware Basin region, is rich with precipitation. This just shows you January and July precipitation averages across New Jersey. Uh, but you can see that we've got uh, a tremendous amount of uh, precipitation in, in, in compared to many regions of the world um, in all of our seasons. July being the wettest month of the year in New Jersey, which is a great piece of trivia to fool students with. Um, obviously, evapotranspiration is very high in the summer as well. So thank goodness we have uh, that much precipitation. But really, we have, on average, ample precipitation in, in the Delaware Basin region, um, sometimes too much. And I'll just show this quickly because uh, I know others may talk on it, the, the, the trifecta of floods back in the first decade of this century for all for different reasons. Um, the flood of record on the Delaware being the, the Connie and then subsequently Diane back-to-back -back storms in August 55. Uh, what many may not know is that the July that preceded it was the driest July on record. So, and both of those months had served amongst the warmest and still serve amongst the warmest um, summer months on record. So it was really quite a tumultuous summer in the Delaware Basin in 1955. Um, and then many of you know of, uh, probably everyone knows of the drought. I say this isn't the Delaware River, it's the Delaware River bed near Trenton. Uh, in the mid 1960s in, if you will, the mega drought uh, that tree rings suggest is unprecedented in several centuries, at least in, in the mid Atlantic states. Um, zipping right on, talking about climate and climate change. Let's cut right to the chase. Climate change 
it's real, it's happening now, and it's affecting here in New Jersey. I stole this from one of my many, many presentations. Um, but that tells you it's happening. This tells you who's responsible for the, uh, the changes we've seen, particularly in the last four to five decades as a very noisy natural climate system of variability. Um, we've been able to see a human signal emerge from that noise. It was about 1980 when you began to see changes to the climate system locally, regionally, and globally that could not be explained purely by natural variability. And we've got a lot to go with this. It's, it's not just observations. We have the greenhouse theory. Um, we have models that can recreate the past. And, and with that, we can use them as our eyes into the future. Um, looking at observations, tying it in with the greenhouse effect, this is the Mauna Loa. Um, time series of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that began to be recorded in 1958. Um, Pre-industrial interglacial carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were about 280 parts per million. Um, it, glacial, 20,000 years ago, glacial CO2 was about um, 200 parts. So 200 to 280, and now we're almost up to 420 parts. And it's all from our use our combustion of fossil fuels. CO2 levels are now higher than they've been any time in the last several million years. It's just one of several greenhouse gases that we are enhancing directly in the atmosphere. Um, and then when we enhance them and warm the atmosphere, that permits more water vapor to be held in the atmosphere. And water vapor is the most ubiquitous of all greenhouse gases. Um, and it's just boosted by the rise of temperature from methane and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, and change, as I said, we have experienced. And, and again, most recently in the last 40 years, these are time series for the mid-Atlantic and that's zone 17 on the map there. So it covers from upstate New York uh, down into and through Virginia. Uh, primarily to the east, well, within and to the east of the Appalachians. Um, and you can see on the top figures, a time series of annual temperature with a linear regression from 1981 um, to, to 2020 uh, to the right. And you can see a very rapid pace of, of change in temperature, particularly in the last four decades. And in the lower panel, you can see how precipitation has changed at a pace since 1980 of about 15 inches per century. Um, obviously, we, it's only a fraction of a century, but we can see how precipitation along with temperatures changed um, on the upward uh, path over the last four decades. Um, this, I just bring to your attention because it just came out a week or two ago. Um, why is it warming so much? And with that increased precipitation here in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, and I've been speculating about this for years, that it has to do with an atmospheric, sh a shift in atmospheric patterns and the warming of the nearby Atlantic. And sure enough, uh, Kermalker and, and, and Radley Horton published a paper that's, you know, has really taken a very good look at this and, and shown that it is uh, a change in the North Atlantic oscillation, uh, the jet stream riding a little further to the north, allowing warm, moist, warm and moist air up in this region, and, and a lot of warming um, due to uh, meridional overturning circulation in the Atlantic Basin slowing down. So I won't go further, but this I think is a very important paper because it's taken the observations and speculation from folks like me and actually looked at it in terms of relationships between them. The other, the interesting thing about the paper though, they tried to model this and the models don't show this very well. So it's, you know, back to the drawing board to see how the models can depict this because this is so important for our future because everything seems, it seems like we are going to continue having these changes in the ocean and atmosphere. So we better understand them. Um, this is just to remind me on the precipitation side that many of you may be familiar with this, it's been no, recognized that more of our precipitation is falling in large events. And need I say more than 
Ida. Uh, to exemplify that, if you're interested in seeing that from a Jersey perspective, um, go to njclimate.org, which is our state climate website. And um, I published, or we posted uh, a report I did on Ida. Best way to access it is look at my September report and there's a link to the specific Ida report in there. And it will be very sobering what you see in terms of the rate of precipitation and the tragic um, fatalities that came from the flash flooding. We have to put the two together temp and precip, and this is a, a drought monitoring tool uh, that's on climate at a glance out of NCEI at NOAA. And you can see that during these last 40 years, um, the, the green, the wetter side has fa been favored as com compared to the yellow or gold um, bars, which show you drought conditions. You can certainly see the 60s drought there just stand out, but you can see uh, 98 and 2002 um, and, and some other drought scares uh, in recent decades. Um, so what does the future look like in the basin? Rising temperatures. We're going to see temperatures continue to rise. Can't tell you how much because we don't know how well we're going to clean up our atmosphere. So it's kind of up to you and I to, to determine how high the temperatures are going to rise uh, because if we keep polluting and putting the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, they might rise six, eight, nine degrees this century Fahrenheit. Um, but if we clean up our act and get a little greener and leaner with our energy use, um, we can reduce that. Um, steadier increasing precip, more energy in the environment, in the atmosphere, um, warmer atmosphere, more moisture rich atmosphere, warmer oceans. So a trigger comes along and you can have a flood, an Ida comes along to trigger that. The trigger's not there, it gets hotter, sky's clear, it gets drier, and we go into a drought scare or deeper into a drought. So uh, a lot of volatility. And then of course, with the lower part of the basin, we have to be concerned with sea level rise. Um, this just two figures showing that we're in this together. It's not just the basin, it's looking across the country, warming expected by the middle of this century compared to the end of the last century, getting wetter in the Eastern two thirds of the country, but drier in the already dry areas of the Southwestern US. But the fact is the climate system doesn't recognize international borders. So that's why the point is we're all in this together, whether it's across state borders or international borders. Um, I thought to put to this group, it was important to put up this slide where we need to keep looking. We need to better understand the baseline change, the magnitude of that, the seasonality. Uh, it looks like summers may not get wetter, but the winters may, for instance, and the summers might warm at a faster pace than the winter. So we've got to look better at the seasonality, uh, the nature and magnitudes of extremes, the extremes we've seen, with the three floods in the basin in 04, 05, 06, Floyd in 99, Irene and Lee in 2011, and now Ida, right on the heels of Henri. Uh, and then the speed and magnitude of sea level rise. Um, we've published something out of Rutgers two years ago that looks at the latest of that along the Jersey coast. Uh, look at COP, K-O-P-P at -P all. A group of us published that uh, under the auspices of NJDEP. And finally, thank you. I hope I haven't taken too long, but I want to finish up by saying this was the 30,000 view at jet speed. If you want a 60 page or so document that tells you more about climate change that you can have your cranky uncle uh, introduced to at Thanksgiving, um, this is a really nice uh, publication put out by the Royal Society and the US National Academies of Science. So thanks very much. I look forward to the discussion in a little while and I will stop sharing. David, thanks so much. It was really great information and a lot of questions still. Uh, and what we will do for participants is we will have a list of the links that are being discussed that we'll send out to everybody. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for uh, inviting me to participate on the panel. So for in the Delaware River Basin, climate change encompasses a lot of different things. These are a few 
samples. On the upper left is a really high tide uh, storm, might have been um, Irene uh, in Delaware. Then you have this was Hurricane Sandy, I think. Um, there are really susceptible populations. This is Philadelphia, where all their water supply comes from the Delaware, but from the estuary, so part saline. Then we have habitats, there's a oyster habitat, and then we also have endangered species, both uh, in the estuary and in the upper basin. We have um, the, the Atlantic sturgeon in the lower basin, and we have the dwarf wedge mussel in the upper basin. We're also seeing um, high tide flooding. Um, there's also sea level rise, which uh, David talked about a, a little bit. Um, there's snowpack and ice. Um, snowpack is important for winter inflows or spring flows into reservoirs, but, and then also you have ice, those can mm -hmm. cause ice jam flooding. And then we have drought. Um, a lot of people, even Dave said that we are water rich, but we might actually be storage poor because we're used to having a lot of water, but in times when we don't have a lot of water, we don't, it, we don't necessarily have the resources to combat drought. Like with all the water conservation that we've had, is our only tool against drought now to cut off people irrigating their lawns? Like that's something that we need to think about. So Dave mentioned um, Ida, and we also had three other uh, tropical storms. We had Elsa, Fred, Henri, and Ida. And so normally in the region, we get about four inches of precipitation in a month. And so just from, mostly from uh, Ida, I guess, but just, so in this region, we had four months of precipitation in a total of eight days. So you can see that from these storm events in this, um, you know, this is a, like, I think it's Montgomery, Chester, Montgomery, Bucks, Hunterdon, and Mercer counties had an incredible amount of rainfall. I know one a car dealership lost all of his inventory, or 75% of his inventory. Not that, you know, obviously the loss of life is much more important, but a lot of people were really devastated. So this is another issue that we're facing. And then uh, this is, these are pictures from um, Pottstown. There was a lot of um, flooding. And then I think there was um, some record baking flooding in the lower basin. And this is the Schuylkill River Trail. A lot of people use this for recreation. And this was entirely inundated uh, from uh, flood water from Ida. I mentioned high tide flooding. The report that Dave talked about, we call it um, STAP. 2019, it's um, obviously a report that he worked on, but they had a section in the back, which I thought was really interesting, where it talked about the number of days that you might see high tide flooding in the area. So this is Bristol, PA, which is about maybe halfway between Philadelphia and Trenton. And this was a winter day um, and people were kayaking. This is actually like, um, kind of like a, a town or actually in Bristol, it's kind of like the waterfront area. And so it says in 2008, you might have 20 high tide flood days where areas near the um, coast or near the um, water would have tidal flooding. They're estimating 20, 60, 50 years from now, almost half of the year, you might have high tide flooding. And that's under a moderate, moderate emission scenario. And then if you look uh, on the right here, this was Luz, Delaware on Sunday. Right? I mean, it was raining, but it didn't seem like it was that bad of a storm. This is uh, water getting pushed up into the estuary. And so that report also said that you might have, um, this is a Cape May number, 13 days a year, you, know, you might have flooding in 2020, 195 days in 2060. So like, again, half the year, you might see high tide flooding in some really uh, populated areas. So you've probably heard me talk about salinity ad nauseum. Uh, to this group. And this is uh, one of the things that we're concerned about, which people don't often think about related to sea level rise is salinity. Um, in the 1960s, the freshwater flow into the estuary was so low, as you saw, there was a riverbed in Trenton, not a river. And 60% of the water that gets into the estuary is from the Delaware River at Trenton. So when you have really dry conditions like that, you put a lot of the water users uh, in this region, say from, you know, actually everybody below um, Philadelphia, there are a lot of water users here, uh, industry, um, Ivonics, they make special specialty chemicals. There's Kimberly Clark. Remember we had that toilet paper scare. Um, there's also um, Philadelphia Water Department. Their intakes are at River Mile 110, also in Jersey American Water. 
And so there are a lot of people who use water from the estuary that they can most of the time because it's fresh. But if you have salt water being pushed upstream with sea level rise, this can become a problem. One of the other issues is um, for marshes, which aren't really seen here, but if we are going to put structures in the river, potentially to protect areas that might get inundated from sea level rise, how does that affect, affect salinity? We might be creating even a, more of a funnel to push salt upstream than we would otherwise. So we did an analysis where, you know how modelers sometimes make um, you know, simplifying assumptions. So when we first did some salinity modeling, we didn't model a lot of the salt marshes uh, because we wanted to you know, kind of eliminate some of the uncertainties. So we just kind of focused on modeling the main part of the river or the main part of the estuary. So we added marshes in and on the right here, you can see the extent of salinity intrusion, like depending on the amount of marsh area you've included. And so for right now, if we include the marshes or we don't include the marshes, we're getting about the same amount of salinity intrusion now. But if you add, go to like one meter of sea level rise, which you might see by the end of the century, the salt can get pushed much further upstream. Now this is, a uh, the hydrology here was 2001 to 2003. That's not the worst drought of record. That's the third worst drought of record. But we can have a, we could have a situation where if we're hardscaping the salt marshes to protect areas areas near there, we could create a situation where we're pushing salt further upstream. So one of the things that we're concerned about is water availability. I work a lot with flow management, as you probably know, and so we're interested in how precipitation and temperature are gonna change flow. Um, this is analysis we did with a hydrologic model and output from um, G global circulation models and um, a hydrologic model. Uh, we looked at different, um, this is the high emission scenario with one model and it shows the inflows to uh, six different reservoirs in the basin, the uh, warm colors, orange, yellow, and gray are the upper basin, those are the first three bars, and the cold colors, the blue, green, and black are the lower basin. And you can see Dave was talking about changes in seasonality. So what happens here is that we have a large change in flow, a large increase in the amount of flow in the winter. We have a reduction in flow in the spring and summer possibly. It looks like we might be a little bit of wet, wetter in the summer in the lower basin. And then generally we have um, basically a modest annual increase in flow. Now, why would the winter change so much? And that's because I think we're getting the precipitation as rain rather than snow. And the result of that is, is that this water is getting to the reservoirs earlier or it's getting to the reservoirs in the winter time. So then you, the flows are low in the spring. And why is that? Well, the, the major source of flow in the spring is snow melt. And so if we don't have snowpack and snow melt, we're not getting these flows in the spring. I'm not quite sure what's going on between the lower and the upper basin. This might have to do with uh, changes in vegetation. Um, we did look at some land use statistics. But so this is kind of what we're, we're seeing. And so um, if you're familiar with the, um, flow management program in the basin, we have some flood mitigation that's related to the storage in the reservoirs in the winter, and we release water to catch uh, spring runoff. If we're releasing all that water sooner and then we don't get the spring runoff, you know, we, we could have lower reservoirs than we, um, than we need to meet the high demand in the summertime. Um, so another thing, this is kind of just the overall change in flow in the basin based on different emission scenarios. So on the low emission scenario, we might actually even see a decrease in flows. That's the yellow, but increases are green and blue. Under RC, and this is for 2060, I have to mention that this is for 2060. Under the medium emission scenario, we actually see a reduction in flows in the upper basin and increase in the lower basin. And that is because we're looking at 2060. And so evaporation and precipitation change over time in the century. And so I, can, I call it the race between um, evaporation and precipitation to see which has a greater effect. 
right? And so in 4.5, evapotrate transpiration increases much, much faster than the precipitation. So maybe it's like, well, we could aim for the, we could look at um, our CP 8.5 for 2060, but you know what? The worst condition is if we're not at medium position. I'm not saying go over and, you know, go, go and, you know, um, use as much green gas or create as much carbon dioxide as you can, but, you know, there's something to be cognizant of if, when we're planning for uh, the future. And so what is um, DRBC doing? Well, as you may know, DRBC is responsible for managing, protecting, and improving water resources in the basin. And there are really some significant uh, potential impacts and threats to the water resources that we might have with climate change. So we are doing a lot of um, work and we want to have um, we want to get advice from as many people as possible and bring many people into the conversation. And so we have established the Advisory Committee on Climate Change. I coined the term AC3. <laughs> and um, we're going to have them talk to us about what they think the threats and vulnerabilities are, what we should look at, and you know, determine different avenues of investigation. And basically, we, DRBC wants to ser serve as a coordinating body for climate-related uh, water resource research in the basin. We should bring people together in one location and talk about all the work that we're doing and see if people are finding different things or finding similar things and then work towards the common goal of protecting our water resources. Um, just one last slide here. So currently we're looking at um, sea level rise impacts on estuary and salinity. Um, we actually are just completing a study on um, temperature and precipitation changes on floor and water availability. We did do that other analysis, we went back and did more. It actually looks like the drought of the 1960s is still a really good planning drought. So that's one thing that we'll be discussing with uh, AC3. And then um, there's a report coming out on water demand projections, hopefully by the end of the month. So look for that. And then um, over the next year or so, we'll be working on a water sustainability plan. And then for flooding um, with Ida, it became really clear that there was a lot of still misunderstanding about reservoir operations and flooding. And so we'll be having some uh, OEM forums at the Office of Manage Emergency Management. I got I got calls from the state police at, at you know eleven o'clock at night, so that was kind of interesting. And then um, with the Climate Change Committee, you know they produced the, uh, we had a forum on climate change. We co-sponsored it with uh, PDE. Um, they are evaluating the sea level rise projections that we're using our work, and then they're working on a climate pol climate change policy, which will be used uh, by the project review group and um, for planning. And that's uh, really all I had. I think I did. Well, it was only three minutes over my time, I hope. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and um, I hand it over to Jen. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, so as David started with a 30,000 foot overview and then Amy hit a basin wide overview, I'm going to hone it in a little bit more and, and talk a little bit about how climate change is impacting um, the New York City um, watershed. So just overview quickly about some of the stuff that is happening um, at the city level and then the DEP level. So New York City has been looking at climate change um, for a while now, Alan Cohen, um, who is our director of integrated water management works in our Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis. Couldn't be with us today because he's on vacation, but he's our liaison at DEP that works with the city and sits on Amy's climate change uh, panel that she mentioned just before. And Alan um, works on behalf of DEP and helping the city determine which climate change scenarios the city should be using um, and then provides that feedback back to DRBC um, through Amy. Um, he also works with the city, you know, they have worked to develop a series of climate change resiliency design guidelines. So the city is working now um, and put out general guidance for every agency to start incorporating climate change into project design going forward. At the DEP level, we have switched gears recently. The main focus really is extreme um, precipitation. You know, we have our stormwater resiliency program and in response to Hurricane Ida, we now have what we are calling the new normal. Um, this is a new initiative that is really in its infancy and just being kicked off. 
Um, and it's an effort to develop better forecasts um, for long-term projections because the city um, experienced some really bad flooding in city um, because of Hurricane Ida. Um, we're also looking at water demand management um, studies for the drought end of it. And then I am going to switch focus a little bit and focus my presentation um, on the water supply. So Bureau of Water Supply, that's where I work. And our mission is to reliably deliver a sufficient quantity of high quality drinking water to the city and our upstate communities. And in order to do that, we operate the city's water supply system which is primarily surface water consisting of 19 reservoirs and three controlled lakes with 570 billion gallons of capacity that serves, you know, half the population of New York State. You know, our watershed is very large. It's 2,000 square miles in eight upstate communities, and we cover a lot of ground here at the Bureau of Water Supply. And as the chief of staff, I also cover um, a lot of ground. And about a year ago, um, I was charged with taking over an integrated modeling group that is responsible for taking a look at not just water quantity for our day-to-day -day reservoir operations and meeting demand, but also water quality. And that water quality staff has done a lot of work over the years taking a look at climate change and how climate change is impacting the watersheds. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, since we don't really have a lot of time to get into too much detail, um, I focus mostly on precipitation. And as others have already alluded to, you know, the most recent period of record shows that we are already getting wetter. And, you know, the future scenarios, the forecasted scenarios show that, that these wet conditions are going to persist, they're going to continue. But I think the biggest takeaway from the science that we have done so far is that we are already in it. And I think that is important. Um, and one of the biggest um, pieces that my staff is starting to take a look at now. And in order to do that, you know, we have taken a look at, you know, some of the recent events that have happened in the last decade and the impacts that have happened on the waters uh, shed and how do we adapt to them in our day-to-day -day operations. So I am very quickly going to run through a few examples here of some of the extreme events that we've experienced in the New York City watershed, starting with hurricanes Irene and Lee um, in August of 2011. So the storm as it was predicted, you know, all the models and tracks were showing over New York City and the Catskills as well as the rest of the Delaware River Basin, you know, expecting about four to eight inches of rain, five to seven inches, you know, around the reservoirs. And our biggest concerns at the time, you know, were maintaining drinking water service in the face of storm surge flooding in the city. High winds, are we gonna have power outages? Are trees gonna blow over? Can we get to critical infrastructure? Are there gonna be water quality impacts on the Catskill system as part of it? And we, can we continue to meet our obligations under the FFMP? But when the actual storm hit, you know, the watershed actually experienced much severe impacts than we were expecting. The rains were a lot heavier, especially in the Catskills. In the Schoharie Reservoir watershed, you know, we had 16 and a half inches of rain in less than 24 hours. Um, severe flooding and property damage, I think, is an understatement. Um, of what actually happened. Um, but the scariest moment for watershed managers throughout the entire event was what happened at Gilboa Dam. And the incident at Gilboa Dam could be a presentation in and of itself. I've seen my boss give it a few times. And, you know, he was the watershed manager that um, actually took the city through this at this point. And at, during um, hurricanes Irene and Lee, you know, Gaboa Dam was already under construction to try to bring it up to today's um, dam safety standards. Um, and, you know, prior record um, peak reservoir outflow was in the floods of 1996, which was 70,800 CFS. And I mean, you could see from the pictures that the outflow was very intense and it was approximately 110,000. CFS. You know, the, the dam, some new instrumentation had been put in it. It all went into alarm mode. Um, nobody was sure at the time if, 
you know, if it was the instrumentation that had gone wonky or if we had actually experienced some movement in the dam. So, you know, he had actually declared a dam emergency, um, which was not a popular call um, by, you know, the New York City administration. Um, but when push came to shove, you know, it was a false alarm for the dam in and of itself. The dam didn't move, the dam was okay. But, you know, by sounding the alarm and evacuating people below the dam, you know, the intense flooding that went down there, um, not just what was coming from the reservoir itself, but, you know, the local um, inflow as well, a lot of homes you know, were severely damaged. And if that dam emergency hadn't been declared, we probably would have seen some fatalities below Schoharie Reservoir. Um, other impacts to the system, you know, there were some really bad turbidity. Um, you know, it took a very long time to get the turbidity under control, elevated coliform levels, debris, hazardous materials were flooding um, into the reservoirs. I mean, it was really, really bad. And I'm kind of glad I did not work at DEP through this event. You know, so the water supply response, I mean, we had to adjust reservoir operations. We had to add alum for a few months to get the turbidity under control after this event. We had to do what I like to call um, diversion gymnastics, you know, change intake levels and where we withdrew the water from. We actually had to change where we were um, disinfecting at the moment. And we had to continue to do release channel operations out of a show can, um, you know, to get the reservoir and the turbidity back under control there. You know, just as the system recovered um, out of that, a year, about a year later, you know, Superstorm Sandy hit. We were coming up on the nine year anniversary for that. And fun fact, um, I started at DEP a few days before her Superstorm Sandy made landfall. Um, you know, we were predicted at that point to have about two to three inches of rain. You know, winds and coastal flooding were really the primary concern. So again, you know, storm surge and flooding in the city, high waste water flows, again with the winds causing loss of power and communication, and then turbidity and fecal coliform compliance um, at our Kensico Reservoir. So in the watershed, I mean, I think people have seen the pictures of New York City with the power outages. And if you haven't seen the picture of the fish in the rafters, the battery tunnel after we pumped it out, I will share those. Um, but up here in the watershed, we experienced wide power outages and telecommunication outages. There were fuel shortages throughout. I think people remember that. A lot of tree and property damage. But a big one for us was the wind-induced turbidity at Kensico Reservoir. So Kensico, the reservoir is wide open. And with the direction of the winds, it was coming right across the reservoir, you know, causing wave action and causing the water to stir um, up on the shoreline. And that building to the left in this photo is our intake. So the concern was, are we gonna be exceeding that five NTU drinking water limit? I mean, again, this is where that um, diversion gymnastics and, you know, the flexibility of the system and the knowledge of our staff came into play. And because of the flexibility that we have in the system, we were able to bypass um, Kensico fast enough um, so that we did not exceed. And, you know, we kept the city um, with, um, you know, fresh water throughout um, the entire um, recovery of Superstorm Sandy. And the last one that I will briefly hit, I mean, Amy uh, went into a little bit more detail about what happened in the lower basin for Tropical Storm Ida. Again, there were new challenges that we experienced here. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too many details with this one just for the sake of time, but I really wanna hit the fact that, you know, we did not get a lot of rain up here in the upper basin and the New York City reservoirs did not spill during this event. And as Amy alluded to, you know, there is a lot of misconception that New York City reservoirs and reservoirs in general, that they exas exacerbate flooding downstream and in the lower basin when they're full, when that's really not the case. So, you know, as we progress through these climate change um, panels, we are gonna take a focus on flooding in and of itself and to kind of take this as a learning moment um, and talk about how, you know, the reservoirs do actually attenuate flooding even when they are full. 
So talking about next steps and where we go from here. So everything is linked, right? So climate change impacts, they affect what happens in the system. You know, we have flooding, we have nutrient loading, there's turbidity, there's damage to facilities that come about, you know, then we have to change the way that we're operating to meet these, you know, changes that are occurring and how are they also affecting the regulations? Like, are we gonna be able to continue to meet, you know, the standards that are set because of the challenges that we are facing from climate change? And how do we, how do, we do this? You know, how do we take that leap? Um, and how do we apply the science that we have already learned, you know, those science and how do we take it and apply it to our day to day operations. I don't have a crystal ball. I, I'm not fully sure how we're going to do this just yet, but we are starting to embark on this journey. And that is one of the things that I am charged with. So, you know, we've done a lot of research and analysis. We've developed a series of climate change indices for the watershed. We have started to make tools and some models are being developed, you know, to, to really help us predict better and see how some of these indicators um, come into play. You know, how much precipitation are we gonna see? Where are we gonna see it? How long are we going to see it? You know, those sorts of things. Can we apply that to what we're doing now? So we've started with a monthly work group. Um, we've had a couple of preliminary meetings just to toss around some ideas. Who do we need to bring to the table? What information do we need to bring to the table? How are we going to get this information applied into our operations? But I think the biggest thing is that we realize that we are definitely still missing pieces. Um, and I think every time we come to the table, we end up having more questions than we do answers. So this is a work in progress. And it's something that I hope to be able to talk to you about more in the future. Um, because we know that each extreme storm has made us face new challenges. We are in it, as everybody has said already. You know, science-based decisions are key and they are critical and we must continue to drive our efforts. And we need to adapt to our changing environment and plan for, you know, future emerging threats. You know, climate change, you know, being on the forefront of that. Um, so with that said, um, that's all I have. And Jerry, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Jen. I'm gonna share the screen here and uh, bring up my presentation here. Um, and here we go. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kelly, for getting us together. A big fan of WADRB, uh, predates the DRBC. Uh, glad to see the, the WADRB assembling these science panels. And I'm really glad to be on the panel with David, uh, the state climatologist of New Jersey up at Rutgers. Uh, uh, and also with uh, Amy, uh, shout Amy at DRBC, at the Colorado River Basin had a DRBC. Uh, it might be a little bit better managed to have someone working day to day like that is very nice to have. Uh, and then Jen, uh, you, you do have the best tasting water. It's true in the United States, I've tasted it, but uh, in New Jersey, the best tasting water officially is the Pensacola Merchantville Water Commission, where I used to work. Uh, it is the best tasting water in New Jersey. So what I want to move is to talk over, uh, move into policy, uh, because I am in the Biden School of Public Policy Administration, and there's a lot of interesting things going on, both nationally and in the state houses. Uh, so one of the things that's very, uh, that we can be optimistic about, I think, is that we have an administration uh, down in DC that, uh, at least in the executive branch right now, that is pushing for big time spending to address the, these very issues. We also have uh, three of the four states in the Delaware Basin, or what we call uh, in policy, we call them trifecta states, which means that the executive branch and the two houses of the General Assemblies all believe in uh, the environment and climate change. Over in the Commonwealth, uh, it's not quite a trifecta yet, but working on that. So that's all good news. Uh, so what, what I did back last winter while we were uh, waiting to see when democracy was going to be preserved and I ran out of uh, Crown episodes to watch with uh, my Netflix. So I just started to assemble white paper. I, I put them together about once every 20 years on, on important topics. I did this last time for the governor of Delaware to address 
the multi-year drought of 95 through uh, 2002. And then the governor appointed me the state water coordinator for that. So this is a white paper I've assembled. It tries to gather everything I know about climate change and policy. I sent it to the White House and our delegation. And I just wanted to talk about what's in there and what's been done over the last uh, you know, nine months since Joe Biden's been the president. So uh, you know, we have some very basic, uh, this is a, a, a paper that's posted on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, it's on our website. And the great thing about white papers are uh, you, you have a lot of freedom. Uh, it is a white paper. You attach your name and your date uh, and you put your ideas out there and they can be changed. Uh, it doesn't have to identify with your institution. And so, uh, you know, my uh, colleagues out in Colorado State, the Stockholm Water Institute said uh, that climate change is water change. This was first said in 2009. And that's a great adage to repeat. And I don't think my friend Brad Udall out of Colorado State uh, who uses this with the uh, related to the Colorado River would mind if we utilize that. And well, how do we can prove that? There's something I learned at Rutgers a long time ago called the clausius clapian relationship that for every two degrees Fahrenheit, David, right? Uh, there's a 7% uh, a more water vapor in the atmosphere. And boy, has that been humid this year. It's still humid out there. So that's happening. Um, and we, I think we're entering a fourth era of environmentalism. We have the potential to do that after the three hours that we've had the last several decades. And my colleague, the director of the University of Minnesota's Water Resources Center, there are 54 of us throughout the United States, and that clean water and air is neither red or blue, it's clear. And so that's something to remember about the uh, apolitical nature of uh, clean water and the climate, I think. And uh, you know, it's been written, but if we can get a, a hold of this climate water challenge, uh, we can uh, address four different issues about the pandemic, the economy, combating climate change, and also achieving racial justice at last. So if we address that, they're all intertwined. And uh, so looking at that, back in uh, 16, I was invited to the White House. There were 200 of us in the, in the Eisenhower office building there. We somehow got to security. And these were the last few months of the Obama administration. And it was exciting. It was exciting because they had a plan. They had uh, met a guy named Ali Zaidi. He was the uh, associate director uh, in OMB. Now he's, uh, I think, the deputy uh, climate uh, scientist in the White House. And uh, you know they're reintroducing that. So I was excited that we can be, uh, we are now uh, moving back to where we were five years ago after the interregnum, let's call it. Uh, so in Delaware, fortunately, we're a very small state. We have an economy of scale. Everybody knows each other. You can bump into Joe Biden over at the, uh, over at the store and you can uh, bump into our governor, but we have an economy of scale. Of scale. We call it the Delaware way. In other words, let's work together in a bipartisan framework. And we have evidence of that when we address the drought of 95 to 2002. We have a water supply coordinating council. We have a national wild scenic river that flows from Pennsylvania to Delaware, signed by Republican governor, Tom Ridge, a very good governor, and uh, a democratic uh, governor here in Delaware, Ruth Ann Minner. Imagine that, working together. We like to uh, let people know about the watershed approach, of course, that the state boundaries don't match the political boundaries. Uh, that's why we have a DRBC. It's the next best thing to having that. I would have liked to have Delaware include the entire river basin boundary if we had our choice 200 years ago, but that's not the case, Amy, I know. Uh, William Penn has something to do with that. Uh, but we've had this golden era of environmentalism, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe 80s, and really it was dormant until about 2020 when we had the Land and Water Conservation Act passed in 2020 by 73 to 22 in the US Senate. Bipartisan support for open space. And that's a good sign, I think, that we can get some things done down there. So what are we up against? We have a, a, a very uh, uh, vertical and horizontally fragmented water and climate system here in the United States at all various levels of federal, state, local government. You can see this is my effort to put them all down on one sheet of paper. Uh, they'll have to work together in the right direction. Uh, we need a coxswain to uh, steer the boat, right? And so that's why we have somebody in charge in the White House. 
So we have all these agencies. There are about 20 different federal agencies in the various departments. Uh, they're organized, like the Corps of Engineers is organized on river basins, like the EPA and the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are not. They're based on state. So why not reform them? Now, I'm, I'm talking about some big picture stuff. Uh, I've talked about uh, perhaps FEMA ought to be a, a cabinet level office again. There's a disconnect there uh, with the two degrees of separation. And David, you might be interested. I've been talking about advancing NOAA. NOAA perhaps to be a cabinet level office, just like EPA is, uh, uh, you know, because it is suborned in the Department of Commerce, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, there's been initiatives with the Civilian Conservation Corps that's coming back. Uh, protected land in the United States uh, is about 12% right now. And E.O. Wilson wrote just five years ago, biologists about the 30 for 30 program, you know, trying to meet that 30% coverage. Fortunately, in the Delaware River Basin, at large, we're up, we're at 30% already, particularly north of Trenton. So we're doing pretty well here in terms of open space and protected land. The EPA trying to take those loans that we have, convert those to grants. The grants were what were really uh, good back in the 70s and 80s when I was in school. And that's what helped to uh, uh, clean up the Delaware Basin. They were converted to loans during the Reagan administration. And perhaps going back to loan forgiveness will be a very good thing. That's in the water and infrastructure bill down in DC. Uh, the poor communities have more hazardous waste sites. So take 40% of EPA's budget and invest them in disadvantaged neighborhoods. That's being done. This was talked about, now it's being done. Something I learned, soil and forests can have massive carbon sequestration benefits. Uh, so if we take the traditional farm bill programs like EQIP and CREP and just steer them toward preserving the topsoil during the winter with no-till and cover crop, you can, you can approve massive uh, climate programs. And there was a bill passed through the farm bill in the US Congress just recently that does this with the commodity corporation that was uh, from the 1930s. For reforestation. One thing I read, uh, there's an article just came out that crops during the, during the summertime at peak growth uh, sequester more carbon than forests do. So we're learning that agriculture can be part of the pie here in terms of addressing climate change. And there are the figures about the existing land cover in the United States. Cropland covers 20% of the United States and forest cover uh, 30, 30%. More forests, more no-till, more cover crop, that's gonna help us. It's not the solution, of course, but you, can, you get a lot more bang for your buck. And what's also interesting is that, you know, you know the natural gas revolution was always talked about a bridge. Uh, the Saudi Arabia gas is Pennsylvania in the United States. Uh, and with that, we're seeing even the EIA, the Energy Environmental Administration in the Department of Energy has said that we're, we, we at the current rate We'll exceed nuclear and coal by 2025, that's renewables. And we'll approach natural gas by 2030. So when the President of the United States says that we can get to uh, a low carbon future in the near future, you, the DOE says that as well. And I subscribe to that. We keep rebuilding, uh, building the windmills off of the coast of New Jersey. Props to my friends over there. Uh, props to Steve Sweeney, who I went to fourth grade with at St. Cecilia's over there. Uh, you know, uh, you know, just very interesting what's all being done. So, uh, you know, advocated for having a high level official in the White House in the Office of Science and Technology uh, uh, and Policy, right? The, uh, the, the president's advisor, Joe Biden's re resurrected that office. And there is a, 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 an associate director of water and climate change in that office that is advising the president. That's all been done. We all know that the water, uh, water has massive economic benefits. We know that the outdoor recreation sector uh, is now dwarfing the oil and fossil fuel sector. And that's a massive lobbying, lobbying group where if you can get the skiers and the snowboarders with their amazing social media skills and this TikTok, uh, that is something that resonates in high places. And that's being done. So that's reassuring as well. And then we have our institutes our water institutes here at UD, at Rutgers, Cornell. We have a nationwide network. There are over 10 million graduates, David, of our institutions. 
that go out and take good jobs, you know, tap the universities we've been arguing. So we need a national water policy. The AWRA has said that. And then we move into climate change. And all the things that I've, uh, I've been concentrating on is the one about the uh, Wall Street, the Department of Defense, and the Fed getting interesting in addressing climate change. Because if you get something much bigger than Ida occurring, uh, it could bankrupt the uh, flood insurance market, the billion dollar flood. It would bankrupt, bankrupt Fannie Mae and Sally, Sally Mack. And uh, you know that's being done right now. I just saw that the president was issued a 40 page report by the Fed and the Treasury Department that outlines mechanisms that Wall Street and the Fed and the Department of Treasury need to take to protect the economy in the, in the cases of these repeated natural disasters, right? Uh, and uh, you know, this is the curve last year from NOAA, the billion dollar disaster events are going up. There's no denying it. So you can have an admiral talk about that uh, the, uh, the Navy based on a Norfolk is going underwater. We listen to them. We could have David and, uh, and Dan Leathers, our state climatologists talk about it. But when Wall Street and the insurance market talks about it, people uh, sit up and listen. So, uh, you know, these are 43 conclusions and recommendations I made. These are just something I keep in my fingertips when a newspaper calls, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. And the good news is that the DRBC is a national leader. Yeah, yes, we're at ground zero because of the warming and the subsidence that's happening with the low lying states that we have and everything that, um, Amy has talked about in Jen and David, but we do have a governance structure and we do have uh, federal and state governments that take climate change seriously. And that's very good to have. And just, just wanted to add that uh, back in the seventies, my barometer was the Delaware River in Pensacola. And uh, Amy, one year, my uh, friends and I, I think I was 12, we walked across the Delaware River during the winter. Uh, down near the Delaire Bridge and got to the other side. We don't know how to go back. And the worst thing, I had to call my mother to come pick us up. You cannot walk across the Delaware River anymore during the winter. Okay, Scott? Yeah, that's exceptional. Um, so we are at one o'clock. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, so we are going to have to hold panel discussion for our next event. I want to let all the participants know we will be sharing information, links to documents that people have referenced, um, and also the video from this panel. So look for that to come out on Monday. We're also going to be asking you what you want to hear about in our next webinar, in the next parts of this webinar series. Um, panelists, are there any final words that you want to share before we say goodbye? No, just thanks for having us, and we look forward to have a much more discussion on this issue and we'll keep bringing you information as it becomes available and we'd love to hear from you did know that thank you to each of yeah. you this this was really amazing david did you want to add add a few words no i said ditto that from amy yeah you know where to find us so uh if there's anything we can do to help you out and i by we i mean climate services um, look for us in our states and in our in this region. All right, panelists, thank you so much. This was really phenomenal. We'll be sharing resources with all the participants. I hope everybody has a great weekend. Thank you, Scott. Hey, everyone. Yeah. Take Bye. care, everyone.